All right, welcome everyone. Why don't we get started today? So it looks like we have everyone kind of trickling in. I think we have about 25 or 30 today on our webinar. So uh, thanks for, uh, for joining me. We have a, a, a really fascinating topic today on inflation. So, uh, you know, this has been, inflation has been something that we've been hearing a lot about um, every day, probably in the headlines you're seeing uh, issues regarding inflation. So that's going to be our focus today. And I try to have a little fun with this called the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, real quick, before we jump in, uh, a couple items. Uh, number one being disclosures. So let me just make sure my stuff is working here so I can advance. Here we go. So there's disclosures. Vance Wealth is a registered investment advisor. Uh, advisory services are offered, uh, are only offered to clients where Vance Wealth and his representatives are properly licensed. So my name is John Vance. Uh, I'm gonna be your host today. And uh, like always, we're gonna cover a lot of really uh, great topics around inflation. And um, we'll do kind of the similar Q&A towards the end. Um, and please submit your, uh, your questions um, just by submitting in the, in the, I think it's the comment section on the bottom. And uh, we're gonna dive right in. So again, the, for those of you who have not seen me speak or been to one of my webinars, uh, my name is John Vance, uh, the president and founder of Vance Wealth. Uh, we're a registered investment advisor firm located in Santa Clarita. Uh, we manage about $450 million for about 250 fa uh, families. So thanks for joining me. Uh, one of the things I have to warn you ahead of time is inflation obviously is a topic around, uh, is an economic topic. And we will get into the weeds a little bit, uh, but I know it's super topical. This is something that on, you know, on the news, in the newspaper, on the internet, it's just it's something that every day there's another data point around inflation. So what I'm going to try to go through today is maybe dispel some of the myths around inflation, uh, kind of go through some of these items just to have a real healthy conversation about inflation, uh, because you know, inflation is not always a bad thing. And so that's what I have laid out here is our discussion for today: the good, the bad, the ugly. Excuse me. Um, and you know, inflation uh, can be a good thing. So that's the good part. Um, and actually, inflation is a good thing. The question becomes, how much inflation is a good thing? The bad. Well, we're going to review current inflationary pressures. The reason why inflation's in the headlines is because it's now abnormally high um, uh, re relative to what we've seen over the last 10 or 15 years. And then the ugly, in my opinion, why government policies might create higher sustained inflation. And those are things that are concerning for the economy, for the markets. Uh, and so I'll, I'll kind of cover... Um, these topics. I'm not going to go in this kind of linear order today. We're definitely going to jump around on these topics, weaving in some of the good, bad, and the ugly throughout. Uh, and I hope you enjoy. All right. Hmm. Let me just make sure it's not working today. I don't know why. All right. So inflation. So this is, we all know inflation. Inflation simply is the rising of prices. And, you know, when you look back, and this was kind of a fun chart that I found, and it goes back as like, what, you know, we all know that, you know, money in the future will buy uh, less, um, you know, than, than it did in, in the past. And so if you look at this, this illustration, it goes back over 100 years, and it shows that in 1916, a quart of milk you could purchase for nine cents. And um, hold on here, I got to hide a couple things on my screen. All right. In, 19, in 1966, um, for nine cents, you would be able to purchase a, one small glass of milk. And now in 2017, uh, for nine cents, you can get seven tablespoons of milk. So this is really the definition of inflation, uh, is that over time, the purchasing power of a dollar will erode. That's natural. That's part of our economic system. And in fact, it's, a, it's, it's not a bad thing. So when you look at another way of looking at inflation is basically inflation is too much money chasing too few goods. And that's really what it is, right? If you have all this money out here looking to consume, whether it's stocks or real estate or cars or whatever it is, that tends to cause inflation when you have too much money chasing too few goods. And so that's at the core of what we're seeing right now. If we actually break it down and be a, uh, to be a little bit more specific, you know, it does get a little bit more complicated than that. And you know, how does inflation work? And there's a bunch of different ways you can define inflation. I'm gonna go through a couple key topics. You have basically this demand pull, this cost pull, and then what's called built-in. 
So demand pull basically means when demand for certain goods or services exceeds the production capacity. And that's certainly something we're seeing right now. COVID's driven some of that, uh, where we're seeing a lot of demand because they're, the production capacity, production went offline. And so we're seeing inflation because of that issue. Um, we're also seeing inflation currently because of this cost, cost push when production costs increase prices, right? So the cost of hiring workers is going up, oil costs are going up, cost of production is going up, containers, a lot of things that are impacting the economy. We're definitely seeing cost push, uh, cost push inflation. And then the last piece is built in. So when prices rise, wages rise too. You know, that's kind of just basically to in order to maintain living, living costs. And we also, we're, we're also seeing that, especially here in California, but I know throughout the nation, is this built-in piece is because the minimum wage in California has been rising from you know, a few years ago, it was at 10, and has now made its way to $15 per hour. And so all of these things are, um, taking, uh, are taking effect today. That's not, that's not always the case, but it is today. Uh, and that hopefully gives you a little bit of background on some of the inflationary factors that can, uh, that can impact the economy. So when you start looking at inflation over you know, many years going back, and um, you can look at these periods of time, I know this chart is a little hard to read. And if you look here, this goes back to 19, how far do we go back? It's almost 1900, I believe, um, or 1920 for sure. And so you can see the periods of the green represents when we have inflation, the periods of red represents deflation. And you know, as a nation, deflation is, is, is probably the worst thing that can happen is when you have prices that are declining because that really puts a stranglehold on the economy. Um, hyperinflation, you know, inflation north of 10% is really bad as well. Um, so you can see historically, you know, as you look at the chart on the left-hand side, it shows annual inflation rates, right? So you can see it goes as high as 20%. We haven't seen that many times in our history. Um, and if you look over the last, let's call it, 40 years, we've had historically low inflation rates. So over here, let me see if I can get a pointer today. Whoops, I cannot, let me go back here. Um, so if you look on the right-hand side, it shows you that up until 2021, we're seeing um, low, in, low inflation rates, um, which we've all known have been the case over the last, again, 40 years, we've seen historically low rates. Um, so that's where we're kind of concerned is, you know, are we going to start seeing this change? Are we going to go into a new environment where inflation becomes a bigger issue? I think in the short term, yes. In the longer term, I would argue no. And that's, that's a big part of our conversation today. So how is inflation measured? So there's eight main categories that are tracked within the CPI. And the CPI is the consumer price index. So that's generally the the index that is utilized to help us get a better understanding of cost increases in the economy. So you can see it's very basic things that we all know about. Food and beverages, housing, apparel, education and communication, medical care, recreation, transportation, and then obviously other goods and services. And so, you know, these are the major eight, eight categories. And, you know, the, 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 the job of the government is to track to see what's happening with the, the rate of change, the pace of change in these is that they want to monitor what's happening because this all this impacts consumers, right? Because we all buy stuff. And so by tracking the CPI, we can see, okay, are things getting more expensive? Are they getting cheaper? And as we know, if you look through all of these as categories, it just depends on the time frame, right? We all know housing is getting more expensive, but the flip side, you know, for the longest period of time, apparel had been dropping for, you know, for decades and also transportation over the last year, oil costs or oil, oil prices plummeted in the middle of COVID or at the peak of COVID uh, because demand went way down, right? So these things change quite a bit, uh, but these again are the, the categories that are tracked. So the other way I like to describe inflation is inflation is the illusion of progress. So think about that, the illusion of progress. And what I want to illustrate here is that if we live in an environment where inflation is running at two and a half percent, and we look at that over a course of 30 years, that means $100,000 today, 30 years from now, would be $209,000. So think about if that's your wages, that's what you're earning. You're earning $100,000 today, you're in your mid-30s. By the time you retire, if inflation runs at 2.5% and you had no other raises, just of inflation, your wages would be at 209. dollars So that's the impact of inflation. Now look at higher inflation. So 25 is really kind of the target of the Fed, you know, 2 to 2.5%. So what if we have 5% inflation, which by all measures would be deemed high, especially for our economy, 
What does that then do over a 30 year period? And look at the dramatic impact. 100,000 is the equivalent of 432,000. And so when I say it's the illusion of progress, it's one of the things that we feel with like real estate prices or, or retirement accounts is naturally they're gonna grow just because of the, of, of the impact of inflation. And, uh, but it really is the illusion of progress, right? And the bottom example, if you went from 100 to 432,000, but that was all just inflation, did we really make true progress? Yes, you have more money, but is it more money in real terms when you adjust it for inflation? And the short answer is no. And so it, it truly is the illusion of progress, but inflation is really built into our economic engine and it needs to be there. And the simple reason why we need inflation is that we, as a capitalist nation, and even as a consumer nation, we do a couple things. We, we, we make investments. Let's use real estate as an example. We make investments in real estate. And if you are buying a home in an inflationary environment, what does that mean? That means over time, the value of your home should go up. Now, take the flip side of that. If you were an investor in real estate in a deflationary environment, what would happen? That means the value of your home would go down. So that's what deflation is, is the decline of prices. And so the reason why inflation is so important is in order to, for, for us to invest in the future and have a long-term outlook, we need some modest inflation built into the system. It also does wonders when you have debt. So let's kind of talk about that. So I put here at the headline, if you have a lot of debt, I know that's terribly subjective. So I, I, it did means any debt at all, but if you have debt, inflation is your friend. So well, what do I mean by that? So let's look at this example. So if you're a homeowner and you have a hundred thousand or a million dollar mortgage and your current interest rate is three and a half percent, let's say you have a 30 year fixed mortgage, you just originated this, your monthly payment on principal and interest would be $4,490. Right, so that's your payment. Now, let's talk about some assumptions and maybe an analysis of this. So the kind of bullet point midway down says, the mortgage payment, let's assume that your mortgage payment is 25% of your gross income. I know a lot of times when people try to figure out how much home you could afford, I just made an assumption that, let's just assume for this example that it's 25% of your gross income. So that means this person's gross income would be almost $18,000. Now, one of the cool things about having a 30 year mortgage is what? your payment is locked for 30 years. So if your income, your gross income grows by 5% annually, and you can look at some of these numbers towards the bottom, in 20 years, your monthly gross income will have gone from around 18,000 to over $47,000. And your mortgage is still $4,500, which is now 9% of your gross income. And in 30 years, your monthly gross income will have grown to 77,000. Your mortgage is still $4,500 and which equals 5.8% of your gross income. So this is one of the big power, uh, power of home ownership is you get to make future payments with inflated dollars. You get to lock in the rates, the, the payment today, but you get, get to pay it with inflated dollars. And so hopefully this illustrated the impact of inflation and whatever your numbers might be, whether you know, based on your loan amount, you know, it's different for everyone, but this is why having some inflation built into the system can be quite healthy um, for a society like ours, where we are borrowing money to buy homes, to buy real estate, to make investments. Uh, because in an example where we have debt, uh, inflation truly is your friend. And this illustration really, I, I hope gives you like the, the, the it illustrates the point. Um, in addition, this is the, one of the reasons why, you know, you look at our current government, I think we owe north of $30 trillion. It's another reason why I do believe that our government is actually hoping for some inflation because we have a, a big payment that we're making. And if we can create some more inflation, then it makes the repayment of that debt easier. So let's go through, and there's a lot of words on here. I do just wanna kind of run through some of these bullet items and then I have some visuals we're gonna go through, but what's causing the current inflation? And, and really, <clears throat> is this temporary? So uh, is, is this gonna go away or is this here to stay? And, and the short answer is nobody knows. I do think it is temporary, uh, some of the inflation numbers that we've seen, but let's talk about what's driving that. So number one, printing of money. So the Federal Reserve balance sheet, um, that we're, we're printing money like crazy. The Federal Reserve is buying bonds. Uh, we'll, I have some graphs for that. The number two, historic, historically low interest rates. So this is creating record highs for stock market and the real estate market. We're seeing U.S. home equity cash uh, cashed out. 
uh, hitting 10-year records. So lots more people are refining and pulling money out, which is creating more money in the system. And then investors are seeking return on capital. So investors are tired of sitting in cash paying zero. They're tired of sitting in bonds that are paying one to 2%. So money's getting freed up to go find risk assets, which is causing some of that inflation out there. Number three, COVID-related issues and response. So we see, we've seen massive supply chain disruptions around the, around the workforce, around the world, excuse me. Um, we've seen a uh, lack of available labor due to COVID fears. And a big part of that is enhanced unemployment benefits. And so there's not enough labor out there. I think I just saw the stat. I don't believe I have a chart in here, but we have something like 9 million jobs, job openings, right? One of the challenges we have getting people back to work is that we have these, un these enhanced unemployment benefits, which are keeping more people at home. Uh, and again, I, there, I'm not discounting there are COVID fears as well, but a big part of that is the enhanced uh, unemployment benefits that are driving people to stay home. Um, the last bullet point on there is massive stimulus efforts. So we have direct checks going to individuals, direct checks going to businesses, and we have these big infrastructure proposals that are coming online. So there's just a lot of money in the system, you know, again, and that's creating some of that inflationary pressure. And then number four, and I mentioned this a minute ago, is Washington, D.C., in our opinion, wants inflation because it will increase tax revenue. And that's really the long and short of it is if we create some more inflation in the system, the Federal Reserve talked a few years ago about creating some more inflation because it's been a little bit low, especially given the, uh, the growth in our economy. So now I'm going to run you through. So that was just that 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 list was a, a kind of a an overview of what we're going to cover today. And now I'm going to go through some graphics that kind of explain what's happening. So this is the Federal Reserve balance sheet. So you can see on the left hand side shows the balance sheet in. I believe this is trillions. Yes. So this is the balance sheet in trillions. And if you look back, kind of this goes back to 2003 up till about 2008, kind of pre-financial crisis, you know, the balance sheet was, you know, below a trillion dollars. And then you can see the spike up because of the financial crisis, the bailouts, the repairing of the economy. And then you can see over time, that number continued to lift higher, even though the economy was on the mend. And you can see kind of peaked out around 2014 and started making its way down through 2020. That was part of the plan, kind of unwinding some of the stimulus that the, the Federal Reserve put in place. But now you can see what's happened during COVID. We've seen this massive kind of, you know, basically, you know, extension of their balance sheet, i.e. printing money, essentially. Uh, I know it's not as quite as simple as that, but that's what we're seeing. And so you can see now the the the, uh, the balance sheets in the seven trillion dollar mark. So you can see, obviously, really staggering. It is forecasted to continue to go higher, um, and that's that's one of the factors that is driving inflation higher. Because again, there's too much too much money out there chasing too few goods. So the next part of this we talked is about historically low interest rates, and so. This is interest rate history going back to 1999. So on the left-hand side, you can see the data shows the interest rate for the Federal Reserve. So the highest point back in 99 was around 6%. So that's when you could get a, find a CD at 6%, a, you know, a government bond at 7 or 8%. That's no longer. You know, now we're seeing rates on the far right-hand side essentially at zero. So we've seen some obviously some ups and downs in our economy uh, in terms of interest rates, but we're now at these low levels. And What's pretty staggering is even though the economy is mending, the economy is getting back on track, the economy is reopening, uh, you can see the, the forecasts for the Fed are, are really to be an environment where interest rates stay low for 2021, 2022, and 2023. So looking at seeing rates substantially you know, at these almost 0% interest rates for a substantial period of time. And, and then you look at kind of the long-term target is 2.5%. So that's where they want to end up once things normalize. Uh, but we're in an environment currently where rates are going to stay uh, low for some time. Now, I will kind of maybe warn against some of these forecasts is even though the Fed has been pretty adamant about leaving rates uh, low, um, some of these inflation numbers, unless they turn around, if they stay elevated, some of these inflation numbers that we've seen in the marketplace in April, May, and June, uh, that may have to get the Federal Reserve to rethink uh, their policy. But this is what they've stated. Uh, so for now, we have to kind of go with what they've said which obviously is highly stimulative for the, for the markets, right? To be able to borrow money at these cheap levels. So one of the, th the, the items that I mentioned is that investors are tired of not getting enough income on their portfolio. I realize there's a lot of data here. Um, the gray, these dark gray charts, this data goes back to 1994 and basically shows that if you had $100,000 in a savings account, 
How much income would you generate? Now, don't we all wish we could go back to the good old days of look at the, the, the 90s, you know, where $100,000 could generate $5,000 a year of interest. And that's what all the bar charts on the left-hand uh, left side illustrate. And then you can see what we've been living through over the last 10 years coming out of the financial crisis is, you know, savings accounts uh, haven't been able to generate more than $1,000 uh, per year. And now our current amount is $100 per year, right? Which is 0.1%. And then it's got some fun stats on there and like, well, how much income do you need to beat inflation? How much income do you need to beat education inflation? And how much income do you need to beat medical inflation? So clearly with these low interest rates, uh, it's really causing investors to go out there and say, you know what, I need to invest more in stocks. I need to invest more in real estate because my money is losing value against inflation. And that's the, the, that was really the design of the Federal Reserve is to get money off the sidelines and get it moving back into the economy. And interestingly enough, it's happening, but even not, not even to the degree that the Federal Reserve had been hoping for. So here's some just kind of some interesting data points. Um, it's from FactSet and Raymond James kind of put together some of this data, but I talked a little bit about these supply chain bottlenecks and it basically kind of shows, uh, so this, the, we have three charts we're gonna look at here. On the left-hand side, it shows rising transportation costs. So the data goes back from January of 19 uh, and looks at what happened through like July of 20, where prices were pretty muted, where we didn't see the spike. And then once the kind of reopen trade occurred, you can see, you know, we started to ship again. Uh, you can see prices spiked up. The dark blue is Shanghai to Los Angeles. And you can see how much higher. So, I mean, prices have almost tripled on transportation costs to get, get goods here to, the, to LA. And then the middle chart shows container production increasing. So we don't have enough containers. We want more goods that need to come here. And you can see they're, they're having to produce more containers to meet the, the ever uh, increasing demand. And then you can see the, the right-hand side chart is record order book on container, uh, of container ships. We need more ships. And I know what's also happening here in Los Angeles is we have uh, ships that are docked and they can't get into Long Beach because we can't get the ships, you know, we can't get the, uh, the containers unloaded and moved out of there fast enough because we have a shortage of workers, right? So there's a lot of things going on, uh, but this is obviously a, uh, this bottleneck is causing some inflationary pressures. This will likely get worked out, right? So we all know what happens in a typical economic environment. You see that prices will jump up because there's not enough supply. Well, you know what happens? People start producing more. And eventually what will happen is the productions will catch up and then the demand will start to, um, will start to slow and that'll bring, bring pricing down, which will, bring, which will remove some of those inflationary pressures. So this is a, uh, just a, uh, a chart on the semiconductor industry. If you're, if you're following the news at all, you've seen Biden talk about this. This is being talked about all over the, all over the world, but we have a massive shortage of uh, semiconductor chips. And I can't see on the left-hand side what the measurable is in terms of um, what those units are representing, but you can obviously see the charts as kind of the gap between ordering a chip and receiving it. Oh, excuse me, that's in weeks. So you can see how long this is actually taking to order and receive those chips. So normally, you know, if we look back at the average, it's like 13 weeks. Well, now that's jumping up to 18 weeks. And this is creating a lot of challenges across all industries because you know, we're now in a time where semiconductors are essentially in everything. Everything you buy from your computer to your phone, to your TV, to your car, we, semiconductors are in everything and, and your vacuum machine, right? So all these things. Uh, so having a shortage is a, is a massive issue that, I, and again, I think Biden had proposed to put together, I don't know if it was a task force or something to, to help, help, I guess, change what's been occurring, but this is happening in every country because it's a massive challenge. This is an area where if we don't get this right size could cause us some, some true economic hardship. Yes, we're seeing some inflationary pressures because semiconductor companies can sell for more because there's amazing demand and they're having challenges filling that demand. But this is another factor that we think is creating inflation, but transitory or temporary inflation, not permanent. Uh, some of the other things we're seeing, and this is you're definitely seeing in, this, in the construction side when we're looking at commodity inputs, right? So if we look actually at um, what we're seeing in these commodities, lumber prices. I mean, look at this. This goes back to June of 2019, um, and we we're at uh, the units around $400. And then now what we're looking at is they got as high as $1,600. So that's a four, four times increase in two years, right? Uh, and that's just because of demand. Now that's coming back. Pricing got a little bit out of control, so we're starting to normalize that. We also see, uh, see steel price 
uh, decline, or I know that's recent, but look at steel prices that have increased about 50% over the last two years. And then alum aluminum prices. Now you can see the headline says lumber prices easing, steel prices decline, and aluminum prices are also declining, but that's from the peak. If you look out uh, over the last two years, we've seen pretty big jumps. Um, so then this really is designed to kind of measure where, where, where has inflation been and where is it going? So it's a little bit of a history. It's not too far back. It goes back to April of 2020, and it shows where the consumer price index is. So we already talked about the consumer price index. Um, historically, the Fed wants this in like the two and a half percent range. You know, that's really kind of the area that they'd be happy with. And so what you're seeing on this trend is that, you know, basically, Going into May, you know, we hit this almost 5% number on inflation. And then you can see on the right-hand side, the chart tends to work its way back down. So we do think it's going to be normalizing. Uh, many market participants, they, they really expect that over the next five years, we're going to normalize it into 2.5%. But, you know, that, what, that's, at the, uh, that's over the next five years. What about over the next one year, two years? And so, you know, while we don't have a crystal ball, our opinion is that the inflationary pressures will be temporary, but might last a little longer than a lot of people think because of some of these things that we talked about. But if you look at this chart, the third bullet point, I think it's consistent with what, with how we've been communicating to you is that long-term pre-pandemic deflationary factors are still in place. Demographic trends and technological advancement, both in the technology sector and in the healthcare sector. We think those are still going to be big drivers of keeping costs uh, under control and having some deflationary factors built into that. So likely going to be peaking here in the next few months um, and work its way down slowly. Uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, this will be stuff we're going to be reporting back. The inflationary scare that I think we're going to see in the media is not going away. Um, so just stay tuned. Uh, hopefully it's giving you some good education. Uh, this was a snapshot that I pulled from the Wall Street Journal. It's a little blurry, but you know, one of the things if we look at the, the data on here, so on the, the left-hand side is personal savings. So th this is showing $6 trillion of personal savings. Look at where it was prior to the pandemic. It was just a little bit over $1 trillion. Now, I know this, this amount has been going up and down, but look at the magnitude of how much money is, is in personal savings. And that's because of all these stimulus checks that have come into place. And then also recognizing that a lot of, in, a lot of individuals didn't really have a great place to spend the money. So money's just been building up in savings. Uh, the middle chart shows consumer inflation expectation. So the next year, definitely seeing a spike. We've talked about that, but over the next five years, kind of normalizing, which is represented in the black. And then the, the chart on the right is probably the most concerning. Um, I don't, I think probably a little bit more conceptually for me uh, than anything. I, I don't know if this has a massive impact on the economy other than like where we got to get back to work. And, you know, when you see uh, these charts, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And so if you look at the, the environment we have right now, we have job openings. Uh, so we have job openings. We're almost, I think it's nine, um, nine million jobs that are available. And we have 10 million people on, uh, 10 million people unemployed. So or 10 or 11 uh, um, unemployed. So that seems like a natural fit that, you know, we should be able to get people back to work. And, uh, and I know that's, we work with a lot of business owners and that's one of the biggest complaints that we hear pretty much across the board is business is great. We're growing, but we can't find people. And that's a growing trend and that needs to be resolved. But with that, with the amount of unemployment, unemployed people, we should be filling that gap. And you know what? We might have challenges right now with job training issues, things like that. But that's where I'd like to see if we're going to put stimulus in place. You know, don't send money just to have people sit at home. Send money if people are going to retrain, re-educate, do things to help get back to the job market, because that's going to be critical for the success of not only individuals and getting back to work to make a paycheck, but also for the long-term health of our economy, because we need workers that can do the jobs that are out there. All right, why is this not advancing? Here we go. So now I just have some kind of some fun headlines. So this was just a picture from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, you know, the reason why we have the, you know, be, behind your long wait for packages, you can see on here, you know, one of them is you can see COVID. Uh, there's just a couple of funny things on here, which, you know, this is obviously creating, this was a little bit of a, of a, of a, of a kind of a funny, uh, a funny headline when it comes to, you know, what packages that are coming from overseas are just kind of stuck. They're stuck at the ports. And that's not going away anytime soon. Uh, we talked a little bit about this. This is a headline from the journal a few days ago. More Americans take cash from homes. 
Uh, and you know that's highly stimulative for the economy, but it's also inflationary because there's a lot of money out there sloshing around. Uh, and we've seen this before. People took a lot of money out of their homes in 2005 and 2006 and 2007. And so you know that's where the Federal Reserve and our government are going to have some challenges ahead because there's a lot. I don't know how we rein in some of that excess cash in the system. So you know one of the things as we start looking at um, you know, questions that we get is around, well, you know, if I'm going to be an investor, you know, what's the best place to invest if there's inflation? And this chart actually goes back to 1926. And it shows that if you had $1 invested, what would the, uh, this is essentially inflation adjusted. So what would the S&P 500 had grown to? And it's $533. So it's up 533 times over, you know, just shy of hundred years. And inflation would have grown from a dollar to fourteen dollars, and if you own treasuries, which essentially is like cash, grew from a dollar to one point five dollars. Sorry, a dollar and fifty cents, dollar and fifty one cents. So this shows you that over time, stock market is a really good inflation hedge, not necessarily in any given year, but over a longer period of time. Um, one of the things that I found fascinating this was this came out of a J.P. Morgan, um, kind of their their brochure on uh, that they put together, I should, should say like their pitch deck that they put together on a, um, <clears throat> on a, on a quarterly basis. And it kind of talked about, okay, based on, you know, different things happening in the economy. So we have four choices here. If you have high and rising inflation, if you have low and rising inflation, if you have high and falling inflation, or if you have low and falling inflation. And what this chart was designed to show you is, well, how many times did this actually happen um, since, 1990, since 1988, how many times did this actually occur? And then what investments did well? Uh, and you know, we know that past performance is not always indicative of future results, but I did find it to be helpful uh, to be able to, to look at this just as to provide some perspective. And so you can see, I would argue that we are still in a low yet rising inflationary environment. And you can see kind of across the board, you know, what were the rates of returns? And some of the categories that did the best were things like emerging markets, gold, real estate, commodities. Um, so what comes out of both of these is in a rising rate, rate environment, emerging markets equity, which means international investments actually did the best. So you know we always maintain a pretty balanced allocation when it comes to our clients, um, our clients' investment portfolios. So we're not jumping into this and overweighting and underweighting based on kind of these charts. However, you know we did just recently add a little bit more to international because we think there's some good value there. Um, those are things that if you have individual questions, we can definitely chat about that. Um, but it does look like we are going to slightly rising rate uh, inter, uh, inflation environment, um, but I still think we're technically low by, by most measures. Okay, so one of the things is if we do get a sell-off, right? You know, we, we always know that the stock market goes up and down. So we would definitely use any pullbacks as buying opportunities. So one of the challenges that we all face as investors is we can get emotional when the markets are volatile, right? So if we're worried about COVID, that may cause us to make poor decisions. If we're worried about inflation, we might make bad decisions, right? So we're definitely going to have some market uh, volatility ahead. Don't exactly know what that's going to look like, but you know, we, if we have a summer pullback or we have some volatility in the fall, some of that might be based on some tax policy changes. Some of that might be based on more inflationary numbers. Not really sure what might occur but we'd really use that as a buying opportunity. So, you know, it would be looking at rebalancing the accounts and putting fresh capital to work and using this as an opportunity to come in and find some bargains. And here are kind of the three reasons why. So number one, money market uh, mutual funds near, near a record. So this shows you how much money is sitting in money market mutual funds. And so, you know, the last time we had a peak, which was in 2008, 2009, you can see where we peaked out. And then the money market rates dropped because what tends to happen is when you get periods of stress, periods of economic uncertainty, cash um, money markets or cash balances tend to spike because people put money on the sideline. They put money in safe areas. So in this example, this shows that we had that occur in 2008 when the financial crisis hit and we had that again during COVID. And so until that money kind of makes its way out of a safe haven into the normal markets like stocks and real estate and other areas or even bonds, you know, it looks like there's still enough cash on the sideline to be to kind of fuel some higher markets. Uh, number two, real yields. So uh, inflation adjusted yields are near record lows. And in fact, they're negative. You know, that's one of the things that we all know. If you have money in the bank, 
which I'm not opposed to. We all need to have emergency money in the bank. We need to have a, you know, a small amount of, of cash relative to the overall size of your net worth in safe assets and, and, and say in cash or um, savings or money markets. If you're getting paid at, the, at a bank a half a percent, which probably would be nice given today's interest rate environment, and inflation's running at 3%, your yield on that is negative two and a half. You're actually losing money every year. Now you don't see that, but you're losing purchasing power. And so you can see here, real yields are near record lows and they're negative currently. And then the third part is record earnings seasons upcoming. So all the projections we've been seeing, you know, comparing to um, this time a year ago, earnings growth is picking up, right? Because we had a full kind of shutdown last second quarter. So second quarter numbers are likely going to look pretty strong from a comparable basis. Um, and so that's likely to fuel potential interest and continued investment in the markets. All right. How are we doing on time? Oh, this is a quick one today. So, um, this is time for questions. So I'm going to kind of scroll up here and see what we have. If we have any questions, I do know that, you know, we covered, covered quite a bit there. And um, these are definitely topics that when we have review meetings with you, if you uh, would like to delve a little bit deeper, we can, we'll definitely share this slide deck. So just a couple of things as we kind of wrap up. So um, we'll, we'll share this slide deck for you. If you, if, again, if you're curious to see a few more, you know, some of those slides, uh, I guess, in an up close and uh, personal way, uh, we'll also be sharing the, the video uh, through YouTube. So feel free to share that. Uh, this is definitely a topic that is on everyone's mind. So if this, I hope, hopefully this was helpful. Um, we definitely would love your feedback. So if you have any feedback today, even uh, through the Q&A, or if you just want to email me, I'd love to hear about it. And this is just a reminder. So for anyone who's on this, who's not a client, if you want to have a 30 minute consultation, go ahead and scan this QR code, and then you can book an appointment uh, with someone on our team. And then I did want to remind you, we're now coming up on almost halfway through the year. So it's, uh, you know, today is July or June 15th. So our next webinar is going to be July 20th at 4.30. And that, uh, that uh, workshop is going to be, or that webinar will be our mid-year economic and market update. So it's going to be a great one. I love doing the mid-year and economic update. Uh, it's not going to be in person, unfortunately. So it will be another webinar, uh, but it'll be a great update on what's going on in the markets and a little bit more specific around investment.